the universe. From the glowing wisps of nebula to the shine of newborn stars. From blazing galaxies to the warm embrace of our own sun, the universe has dazzled humanity for all time with its brilliance. However, the universe is mostly space, and that space is cold, very cold. But that doesn't mean there isn't anything to see. When observed in a special way, even cold things glow. Like these strangely colored blobs, they aren't exotic cosmic objects at all, nor will they ever fill a room with their light. Even these ice cubes emit radiation we can detect, infrared radiation. Infrared radiation is created by the motion of atoms and molecules that are in matter. So even objects that we think of as being very cold, such as ice cubes, emit radiation. Like ice cubes, the coldest things in space emit radiation. And with special instruments, we can detect this radiation to reveal a dazzling universe of unseen wonders. Legions of galaxies and what lies within their cores. The secrets of seemingly empty space. The birthplace of stars. And even the birthplace of planets. Planets like ours. How do we see these things? With the Spitzer Space Telescope, the last of the four great observatories. Spitzer's greatness is not due to its size. With a mirror less than three feet across, it is easily dwarfed by the other great observatories, Hubble and Chandra. But despite its modest stature, Spitzer's infrared observations are a thousand times more sensitive than any ever made. That's because it does its work in the frigid depths of space. Positioned in a unique orbit a million miles distant, Spitzer trails the Earth like a lone sentinel, following us as we journey around the Sun. Here in the deep freeze of space, Spitzer is far from anything that would interfere with its infrared vision. By gazing into the distant reaches of space-time, or perhaps somewhere nearby in our own galaxy, photons are gathered by Spitzer's mirror. From here, the photons can be directed to different instruments that are frozen in liquid helium so they don't emit infrared radiation that would interfere with the observations. With a photometer, spectrometer, and cameras, Observers can count, characterize, and make images with the infrared energy from sources, allowing us to see what has never been known. They can see stars that are invisible to our vision. They can sense vast, invisible clouds of matter and reveal what they are made of. They can reveal dust around stars, dust that is forming planets like ours. And they can detect galaxies in the deepest reaches of space-time. Main engine start and liftoff of the Delta II. Launched in August of 2003, Spitzer has completed its primary mission to establish a legacy of new information about our universe, the Spitzer legacy. How do stars form? What causes them to form?
How do solar systems form? Do all stars have solar systems? Are there any solar systems like ours? Are there many? Are there few? What does our galaxy really look like? Are new stars forming in our galaxy? Where? Why did galaxies form? Were the first galaxies like our galaxy? Why are galaxies where they are? How did the structure of the universe form? These are questions that the Spitzer Legacy Program is designed to address. Using Spitzer's unprecedented infrared vision, six programs focused on different aspects to fill gaps in our knowledge. Two Spitzer Legacy Programs were designed to understand the universe on the largest scales. They were Goods and Swire. GOODS is, stands for the Great Observatory's Origins Deep Survey. The origins part is a reference to our own origins. Our, it's a search for the origins of galaxies and the components in galaxies, the, the constituent parts of galaxies, dust, gas, stars, how that material collected together and built up and gathered into the units that we call galaxies today. Where did those come from? How did they build up over time? We know what the local universe around us is. We know what our Milky Way is like. We know how massive it is. We know what its stars are like. Uh, we have some idea of how old it is. Um, and we would like to know how it got to be that way. We know that the universe didn't always have galaxies like the Milky Way. At one time, it didn't have any galaxies at all. So how did we go from that early era where there was very little to a universe like today where we have big galaxies like the Milky Way? So we're searching for our origins using the great observatories. It's a deep survey, deep meaning both faint and also deep in the universe, to see great distances uh, and far back in time. We can now see galaxies back 90% or more of the way back to the Big Bang, back to the beginning of time. We can see some of the youngest and earliest galaxies known. It's, it's like a core sample or an archaeological dig. We're, we're, we're digging down through the universe and seeing earlier and earlier eras by measuring the light from those galaxies at younger and younger times in the universe. People, as long as there have been telescopes, they've been trying to take deep pictures of the sky to see faint objects, to see far away, to see far back in time. So, Goods was uh, inspired to some degree by previous deep survey efforts. The Hubble Deep Field was an effort to use Hubble to take the deepest image of the sky ever uh, that had been taken at optical wavelengths. Many people have seen this image. This was done in 1996 and has become sort of an icon of astronomy, this deep field image of distant galaxies. The problem with a deep survey is that you usually only cover a very small region on the sky. Our goals in a survey like this are to understand everything about galaxy evolution, about how galaxies uh, uh, developed and evolved over time, but it's like trying to do the demographics of a population from studying just one city block somewhere, a very small uh, sample to work with, and you really don't know if you had gone from Baltimore, studied a city block, and gone to uh, you know Coral Gables, Florida, and studied a, another block, whether you'd get the same answer. So you really would like to have a comparison sample by looking somewhere else. The other really important aspect was uh, that the Hubble Deep Field was an optical survey. The, the images that you see in the Hubble Deep Field of these distant galaxies uh, are fascinating. They tell you about the structure of galaxies, they tell you about uh, how they've grown with time and how their shapes have changed, but it's not the whole story. There's a much broader story out there that can be learned by studying energy coming out at other wavelengths. So with goods, what we wanted to do was to first expand the scale of a deep field survey, to use two fields, have larger fields than the old Hubble Deep Field Survey, and infrared light with a telescope like Spitzer. Spitzer gave us really the opportunity to kick off a much more comprehensive deep field survey that would give us a better overall picture of how galaxies formed and evolved. Because GOODS is a deep survey, it's really focused on the most distant objects. Um, you can't learn everything from a deep survey. You also need wide, shallower surveys. There are Spitzer legacy programs like the SYR project being done with Spitzer that cover wider areas of the sky. Goods is a deep survey, just as the Hubble Deep Field was a deep survey. Uh, so we're interested in the most distant uh, galaxies. Distant galaxies are red-shifted. The universe is expanding. 
uh, the galaxies are all moving apart, and the light from galaxies uh, that are distant and moving away from us is stretched. The wavelengths are shifted to the red end of the spectrum. When we look at an image like the, the original Hubble Deep Field, the, the Hubble image of those distant galaxies, most of the light we're seeing is, even though it's an optical photograph, an optical picture, most of that light isn't optical light at all. It's ultraviolet light uh, that has been redshifted into the wavelengths that the Hubble optical cameras observe. What ultraviolet light tells us is about the hot young stars in galaxies. The stars that have just formed very recently, um, they're very hot temperatures, they have put out a lot of blue and ultraviolet light. Um, so it's telling us about the recent star formation in galaxies. That's of course interesting, but it doesn't tell us about the past history of that galaxy. The older, cooler stars that actually make up most of the mass, uh, those you don't see in that blue light. Those have red, cooler spectra that sh the light is out at longer wavelengths. To see that light, that has all been shifted out to infrared wavelengths, out of the optical window, and we need a telescope that works at those longer wavelengths in order to see those. And before Spitzer, there was really no facility that could see the light from the stars that dominate the mass of galaxies at these early times in the universe. There was really just no way to do it. From the ground, you can't see faint enough. The sky is too bright. You just can't see these galaxies. There's just no way. And no previous space mission had the capacity to do a deep survey like this. So Spitzer is giving us a chance to see, essentially to weigh distant galaxies, to measure the mass of stars in those galaxies by observing the light at wavelengths where the, the, the stars that contribute most to that mass radiate. That's one of the two major things. The other aspect uh, that Spitzer allows us to study is uh, the energy emitted by stars that are newly formed or by giant black holes inside those galaxies, what we call active galactic nuclei, the, uh, the giant black holes that we now believe live at the center of most galaxies. The thing is, a lot of that energy gets absorbed by dust, whether it's from star formation or from these black holes. Um, and it would be coming out at shorter wavelengths, ultraviolet wavelengths, but the gas and dust in these galaxies absorbs that light. And where does it come out? It has to come out somewhere. It comes out again, re-radiated at these cooler temperatures and longer wavelengths, uh, where Spitzer is the instrument of choice to observe it. And what we see is a process by which the galaxies were much smaller and much less massive at those early times, and they get more massive with time. So somehow we're trying to understand that process by which the galaxies have built up their material, built up their mass over the history of the universe. The Swire survey addresses what is perhaps the biggest story of Spitzer's first legacy missions. This infrared image made by the Swire survey contains over half a million brilliant gleaming sources. It covers more area than 36 full moons. In astronomical terms, a gigantic swath of sky. Yet this image is only one of six fields that together cover an area larger than 250 full moons. Look closer, and the enormity of this single image becomes apparent. Vast numbers of what first appear to be pinpoints of light are not what they seem. The pinpoints are entire galaxies seemingly innumerable. By virtue of this wide coverage, Swire is helping to piece together one of the biggest subjects in astronomy. The large-scale structure of the universe and how galaxies evolved within that structure. This image covers the same area as the Swire image, but it looks much different. It is a simulation of structure in the universe, showing the distribution of matter that makes stars and galaxies. With the information that Swire is providing, Astronomers hope to put the two pictures together 
and finally understand a true picture of cosmic structure and how galaxies evolved within it. Swire looked at six separate uh, fields on the sky, that is six, six separate directions at uh, high galactic latitudes. And the reason for that is that we wanted to look out of the plane of the galaxy. And since we're sitting in the plane of the galaxy, we're sitting in the middle of a lot of interstellar material, which blocks our view of the extragalactic sky. So we looked up above the plane of the galaxy and, and out through the higher regions where there's very little interstellar material between us and the external galaxies. And we picked six fields around the sky that have exceptionally low amounts of interstellar material between us and them. And in all told, we observed about 50 square degrees, and that's about equivalent to the area um, covered by about 250 full moons. We used the two instruments that have imaging arrays. Uh, that is, we basically just uh, took images of the sky in all of the bands available to those two different instruments. The two instruments are the infrared array uh, camera, which works in the, in the shorter wavelength bands. And then the other instrument that works in the longer wavelength region is called MIPS, the multiband imaging photometer, which has three uh, wavelength regions. And we observed in all three of those as well for a total of, of seven bands. So we, we wanted to use all of those seven uh, wavelength regions because each one is sensitive to different emission mechanisms from uh, the galaxies that we're looking for. At the shorter wavelengths, we can see chiefly the light from the stars themselves, the starlight, and they shine most brightly in the shorter wavelength bands that the infrared array camera is sensitive to. And in addition, we wanted to, at the same time, in the same regions of sky, uh, detect the light from um, the interstellar material that lies between the stars. And it chiefly emits at longer wavelengths, and so we wanted the longer wavelength camera to image the sky at the same time. The primary goal for SWIRE is to understand galaxy evolution. And we decided we needed to look at large fields because we wanted to look at the evolution of different types of galaxies together in the same volume of space. We didn't want to zoom in on one kind of galaxy over here and a different kind of galaxy over there. And in particular, we wanted to trace those galaxies over the cosmic web. The cosmic web is the filaments and clusters and voids, the patterns of galaxies as we find them in the universe. They've been mapped very well in the local universe, but not so well in the distant universe at all. And so by taking Swire and looking deep into the universe in large patches of sky, we could actually see how things are forming at moderate distances away from the Earth. One of the key issues is that uh, we don't understand the relationship between the cold dark matter that we suspect lies out there tracing the, the major structures in space and the way that the galaxies have formed within the um, concentrations of this dark matter. Now, cold, cold dark matter is one of the strangest concepts we actually have. Um, if you look up at the night sky, you see the stars shining brightly and you think the universe is dominated by these, these wonderful points of light and then the uh, galaxies that are agglomerations of stars which, are, which shine brightly. But in fact, to our astonishment, we learned that only about 4% of the matter in the entire universe is actually visible, whether through the naked eye or the telescope. And in fact, astronomers believe that about 20% of the rest of the matter in the universe is, is what we call this cold dark matter. And it dominates the gravitational behavior of what we see, the, the galaxies, the, the light elements. And so we can look for the galaxies and we can trace out their, their structures on the sky, and that's what we're trying to do with SWIRE. Um, and we're hoping that it will highlight the dark matter that lies underneath that we can't see. The way that SWIRE is going to uh, study the evolution of galaxies is what we want to do is compare how the distant universe looks to the local universe. Astronomy has this fabulous aspect to it that we can use it as a time machine. Because light takes a, a finite amount of time to travel, the further away an object is, the further back in time you're actually looking back to see it at. And so if we just look across the solar system, we're looking at the distance of a few light hours. But if we look outside to the Andromeda Nebula, which is our nearest um, neighbor large spiral galaxy, that's about two million years. So we're seeing Andromeda as it was two million years ago. Now, if we just keep on looking further and further away, back into the past of the universe, we can see how galaxies actually appeared a long time ago. We just look further away, and there it is. And so Swire is looking back large distances, a range of distances, up to several billion light years ago, just by looking far enough away into our deep field images to see the galaxies, how they looked before. So we, we, we will measure 
how they appeared in the past, and then we will compare them to objects that we know and love in our local um, universe. For example, a beautiful spiral galaxy such as the Whirlpool, um, we can look in detail at it in the local universe and then look back at some distant examples and try to see how its predecessors might have looked far back in the past. Again, another example in the local universe, we might look at the beautiful um, active radio galaxy Centaurus A, which we can see in glorious detail locally, and then look back to see what kind of objects were like it or might have evolved um, into it um, in the distant universe by using this wonderful light travel time machine. Swire has an interesting technique for identifying different kinds of galaxies in the distant universe and comparing them to the local universe. In fact, it's a technique that Spitzer as a whole um, uses and, in fact, was partly designed to do. Now, um, different kinds of galaxies emit in different proportions in the different wavelength regions that Spitzer can observe with. So in the, uh, the shorter wavelength instrument, the IRAC camera has four bands which are very sensitive to the light from old stars, and that's true both in the local universe and in the distant universe, whereas the MIPS instrument, the longer wavelength one, is sensitive to the re-radiated light from dust. That is, when stars are mixed with interstellar material, they can heat up the dust, and then that dust emits light. And we can see that... Uh, um, idea by looking at what we call the spectral energy distribution of a galaxy. So on this plot here, what we're looking at is along the bottom axis, we have the wavelength range going all the way from optical wavelengths here out into the very far infrared over here. If we look first in this top panel up here, we have a star-forming galaxy. And and the black line shows the, the spectral energy distribution of a well-known local object which has a huge amount of star formation currently going on, but also has the light from the um, already existing um, evolved stellar population still very visible. And that's shown um, here by this bump that we see in the black line. That's actually the emission in the, in the near-infrared wavelength region from the old stars that exist um, that, that dominate the starlight of the galaxy. And then in addition, we have this excess of emission here, a very strong and bright um, component. This is actually produced by the interstellar material, which is being heated up by young stars as they form in clouds of gas and dust. Down here in the bottom two panels, we have some very different objects. These are active galaxies, or um, quasars, where there's a massive black hole embedded in the object. And in fact, the light from this uh, quasar is so bright it's completely overwhelming any light from stars. Now there's another class of galaxy that we are looking at with Swire that's important to recognize and it can also be determined from the general shape of its spectral energy distribution such as those we've just been looking at is an elliptical galaxy and it differs from the two that I've shown you in that it does not have much radiation at all in the longer wavelength bands the energy just keeps on falling off and, and into the infrared because there is essentially n not much interstellar material in these objects and no ongoing star formation, so we just see, see the old stellar light. Now, the difference between these different uh, spectral energy distributions that we've been talking about is how we are able to determine what kinds of galaxies we're looking at at the distant universe, too. So now, if we look again at this figure, and instead of concentrating now on the black line, which is the illustration of um, one of our local objects, but instead we look at the red points, these are some Spitzer measurements of an actual distant object that we've discovered in one of our fields. And what we can do is we can look at this general shape and try to compare it to one of the spectral energy distributions that we have from objects in our local universe, and by comparison, um, make a judgment as to what kind of object it is we're looking at. Moreover, um, because of the expansion of the universe and the consequent redshifting of objects within it, um, we can use that to, to get an estimate of how far away the object is. What we do is we take the spectral energy distribution, the black line, where it starts out in our local universe, and then we slide it to the right until we get a match to the Spitzer object. And when these points line up nicely with this peak that we see in our local template, then we have a good match both to, both to the kind of object we're looking at and an approximate estimate of how far away it is. 
So you can see that using this technique, we can do two things at once. We can get a good characterization of the kind of object we're looking at from the general overall spectral shape, and we can also use the amount of redshift that we had to apply to the local template to get an estimate of the approximate distance of this object in the universe. So what we're doing with it, this technique is trying to um, discover the differences in detail in the evolutionary history of galaxies at the earlier epochs and compared to how the universe appears today. And so what we can do is we can map out the structure of these different kinds of galaxies across the large areas of space that we're investigating. We can look for clusters, we can look for filaments, we can look for areas without any of these kinds of galaxies, and we can compare how the active galaxies, the quasars, look with regard to their structure on the sky to the actively star-forming galaxies and to the evolved ellipticals which don't have any star formation going on at all. Well, so far we've found some very tantalizing new results from these um, investigations. It was known previously that both star-forming and uh, star-forming galaxies and quasars had a much higher peak in their activity at, in the early epochs of the universe than they do now. But Swire has begun to map these out in detail. And one of the first things we've discovered that the very brightest objects seem to be dominated by quasar light. But as we drop down just a little bit in brightness, we find lots and lots and lots of very luminous star-forming galaxies. And they tend to dominate the Spitzer samples very strongly um, when, when we map them out on the sky. We are also finding some evidence that these highly uh, luminous star-forming, actively star-forming galaxies um, are highly clustered. That is, they might in inhabit the most dense regions of the universe at these epochs. And we're talking about distances or look-back times of five to seven billion years ago. What we're discovering with SWIRE will contribute to our overall understanding of how galaxies formed and how the large structures that we find galaxies in today came together. What we're discovering is the star formation rates that were going on at early times in, the, in some of the most massive galaxies as a function of where those galaxies lie within the large-scale structures that we see. And we're also tying into that the quasar activity. We think that the, the growth of galaxies is, is very closely tied to the growth of the black holes inside of galaxies, and we're able to map that directly by using these techniques to distinguish these two different kinds of galaxies and see how they actually coexist in space at these epochs a long time ago. So the ultimate goal of SWIRE is to be able to map these structures out on the sky, delineated by the different galaxy types, and not only in two dimensions, that is a map on the sky of filaments and clusters and voids, but in three dimensions. And so we'll have a volume uh, of the sky at, at uh, these moderate to, to distant distances in the universe where we've actually mapped the distribution of the different types of galaxies. And ultimately, we hope to compare that to what is seen in the local universe in some of the large-scale surveys that have been done in recent years, such as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which has actually taken a huge amount of effort to map the entire northern hemisphere of the sky locally. We think of SWIRE as the Sloan of the higher redshift universe, and we'll be able to directly compare the structures seen at those higher redshifts in SWIRE to the local universe and see how they have changed in time. By gazing into the deepest reaches of space-time with goods and revealing millions of distant galaxies with SWIRE, the Spitzer Legacy Program will help us understand the secrets of a hidden universe and how it came to be.